Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar organized by Equitaire in collaboration with uh, the David Suzuki Foundation and the Cyrano. I'm just going to give ourselves a minute before I start. So uh, grab your lunch and uh, sit comfortably while uh, I wait one more or, minute. Or your breakfast if you're in the West Coast. Or your breakfast. So I guess I will slowly start. Um, so I'm Andrian Brazo. I am a climate policy analyst at ICTAR, and I will be uh, moderating this panel today. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we're excited to present the results of our latest uh, study on SUVs. And uh, well, before I begin, I will uh, quickly mention that ICTAR's offices are located on indigenous lands that have not been ceded by treaty, which we now call Montreal and Quebec City. And uh, we recognize that indigenous peoples have protected their territories since immemorial times and have used their traditional knowledge to guard the lands and waters. We are grateful to live on these lands and are committed to continuing our efforts to protect them. Um, I will also mention uh, that we have a Q&A section at the bottom, which you can use. Uh, to ask your questions, there will be a period of questions and uh, for other comments, uh, please use the chat section. Today, I am joined by Verena Gruber, who is Associate Professor at the M. Lyon Business School and the collaborator with the Cyrano uh, Research Center based in Montreal. And I am uh, also with Tom Green, Senior Climate Policy Analyst at uh, the David Suzuki Foundation. So um, here's a quick overview of what we'll be uh, talking about today. So I will quickly introduce uh, Equitaire, uh, who is mostly known in Quebec. Uh, then I will talk about uh, a bit of context, why we're working on this on the issue of large vehicles uh, such as SUVs. Um, I will also talk about the campaign that we that this study that we're presenting today is part of, which is the human scale transportation campaign. Uh, then we will have uh, Mrs. Uh, Gruber present Serrano's survey results. Tom will then uh, present the results of uh, the well another study that was held um, in the Vancouver region. And we will quickly discuss the solutions that uh, that are in front of us to 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 tackle the issue of uh, of SUVs, and we will finish with a uh, Q and A session. So very quickly, uh, Ikita is celebrating is its thirtieth birthday this year. Uh, we work in education, in uh, in policy, in research. And we do all uh, types of work in four fields of expertise, which I will present uh, later on. And um, so this campaign that I'm presenting today uh, is part of our uh, education and awareness raising efforts. We have uh, we are one of the main uh, environmental organizations in Quebec and in Canada. So you can see here uh, the the reach that we have, and so we're really uh, we're really happy to continue to to continue to to continue. Sorry to 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 grow our our reach uh, across uh, the country through the issue of SUVs, which is not an easy one uh, to tackle. So as I was saying, uh, Equitaire uh, has uh, an expertise in the four uh, sectors that appear on the screen. So we work uh, in energy and climate, in agriculture and food systems as well. We also work in uh, production and consumption of goods and in mobility and transportation. I will quickly introduce Ikita's vision for sustainable mobility uh, before we uh, dive into the campaign that uh, we're, uh, we'll be talking about today. 
So why do we work in transport? Well, the answer is really simple. Well, since a lot of our action is Quebec-based and Canada-based, well, we just need to look at the numbers. So in Quebec, it's almost half of our greenhouse gas emissions that uh, come from the transportation sector, especially because of the increase in the number of vehicles on our roads and of the size of the these vehicles. And uh, while well, the energy sector is more... Uh, is more emits more GHG emissions at the at the Canadian level, which is why it's only 25% at the Canadian level, but it's also a very, very important issue uh, at, across the country. So the way we, we work at Ikita, we, we really want to, we, we do not focus solely on electrifying vehicles while it is one of the key uh, pieces of the puzzle. So uh, we use a, a recognized um, approach by uh, researchers in the academic uh, sector uh, in terms of transportation. So uh, we use the reduce, transfer, improve approach. Uh, so we want to reduce the need for trips and for, for, uh, for, for travel, basically, uh, through land use uh, and better, through better land use and transportation planning. And then that's used to, um, to transfer uh, the, well, basically to go from, uh, from a solo car to a, a more sustainable mode of transportation, whether it's public transit or uh, active transportation or shared transportation. Uh, so the idea really is to reduce the number of vehicles on the road, which is uh, the opposite of what we currently see happening uh, in our society. And lastly, we want to improve the remaining vehicles that are on the road through uh, electrification, but also through a better use of resources, which means smaller cars. And uh, of course, that also means making sure that uh, the transportation options are, uh, are, are have less impact on, uh, on society. So they have uh, the improved social justice, uh, safety, and uh, cost. At Ikita right now, we currently have four campaigns uh, going on in mobility. So we have a, the Vidovat campaign, which is a, a, a campaign uh, that, uh, that focuses on uh, electric assisted bikes for a daily commute. We also have the running electric campaign in which we raise awareness on uh, the benefits of switching for uh, an electric vehicle when that's the best option. Um, and then we have the Canadian Electric School Bus Alliance, which aims at uh, which aims to accelerate the electrification of school transportation, uh, because we know that diesel has a very uh, important impact on our health. And lastly, the, the, the campaign that we'll be talking about today is the human scale transportation campaign, uh, which tackles the, the, the size of vehicles. So for human scale transportation is a three year uh, education and awareness raising campaign that is funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, and it is it will be ending uh, next year in 2024. Uh, so why did we choose to talk about the size of vehicles? Well, um, you can go to the next slide, please, Anthony. So, well, these these are numbers for Quebec, but I think they really speak for themselves. Uh, on the, the left, we see that the red portion is, uh, well, the increase in the number of light duty trucks on the roads, which is quite striking. Uh, and um, basically uh, in Canada right now, four out of five new vehicles sold are light duty trucks. So we can really see that it's a trend uh, well, every year this number uh, is greater, uh, and uh, we do see that that greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector are not reducing, even though we have more and more electric vehicles on our roads, and that's part of the uh, of the issue. And so this campaign is based on a two-year research project that we did with the Cyrano. Uh, Verena, uh, who is with us today, was part of the research that we did uh, in the last couple of years. And so we really explored the, all the, the causes that explain the popularity, the increasing popularity of light-duty trucks. 
Uh, so we went through the causes, but also the consequences. So what are the impacts uh, on safety, on public finance, but also on private finance, on uh, the environment, of course, um, on congestion as well. And uh, this was led uh, in partnership with Polytechnique Montréal and uh, the Cyrano and HSC Montréal. So our new campaign basically uh, aims to, to open a public debate on, uh, on large vehicles as they are more and more normalized in our society. We want to address it a bit in a similar way as we did with uh, tobacco a couple of decades ago. Uh, we want to bring up the discussion and say that, well, do we, we want to bring people to, to ask themselves, uh, well, to assess their actual needs when it comes to transportation, because right now what we see is that, uh, well, advertising is creating a big need, uh, a big desire for those vehicles, and we need to, to it's kind of a, a campaign that aims to uh, to counterbalance this, uh, those those marketing efforts from the car industry, which is a big objective, let's be honest. Uh, so uh, our target audience is mostly young people, but for very specific reasons. Well, uh, the data shows us that once once consumers uh, have bought a an SUV or a pickup truck, they will rarely go back to a smaller vehicle. So we really want to talk to. Uh, young people who have not necessarily bought their first car yet. Um, we also think that for well finance reasons, the more vulner vulnerable communities such as uh, such as uh, well low income households and newcomers uh, well need to be uh, need to be informed of of the of the practices of the car industry. And uh, well, on that side, well, we also work with the advertising sector uh, to to hopefully improve those practices. So our uh, campaign is really led uh, by a by many partners. So as you can see on the screen, uh, we really collaborate with uh, with organizations from different sectors because the idea is really not only to focus on the environmental side, uh, on the climate impacts of SUVs, but also on the uh, on the safety aspect and the finance aspect, as I was saying earlier. Um, because we do also we did also see in our research that uh, the main reason, well, the the thing that would convince people not to go for them. Is really only an environmental factor, so that's why we we um, we went with uh, more partners from more sectors. So, as part of this campaign, we do uh, research activities to continue to build on what we did in recent years, um, and to well to find new angles to bring up the discussion. We also uh, do advertising campaigns on uh, many types of media. So you may have seen our ads. I will show one, one or two of them uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we also want to uh, raise awareness at events such as uh, car shows uh, and through webinars such as today. And lastly, well, we, we developed some tools to help the, the decision making process of uh, specific publics. So here are one or two advertised ads that we created. Uh, they're in French, unfortunately, but the idea in this one, for example, is to say that um, we rare uh, that well, we want to <laughs> use the the vehicle to. We think that we will use the vehicle to go to do these uh, these trips on uh, the Côte Nord, which is very north uh, of Quebec but we just go on uh, in, in the suburbs of Montreal in reality. Um, so uh, an SUV emits on average 20% more um, GHG emissions than a car. And that's the number that we're focusing on here. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of the ads, but if you go on our website, uh, on, the web, on the page of our campaign, you will see that um, you will see all of our uh, current ads that are uh, in the media. So without further uh, ado, I will uh, 
Oh, um, there is one thing that I will mention before <laughs> letting uh, Virena uh, do her presentation. Uh, so we have, as I was saying, we developed some tools. So on our website, you can also find a, a vehicle comparator, uh, which is uh, which is a tool where you can enter two types of vehicles and see the different impacts that they have on the environment, on safety, on finance, on um, traffic, and uh, and such information. And we also have a guide for uh, financial literacy to help uh, consumers um, uh, better understand all of the uh, tactics that we see uh, from the from the car industry, like uh, like the the uh, the fact that the payments are laid out on several years, for example. Um, so we can now go to Verena Gruba from the Cyrano who will present uh, the survey that they conducted in Quebec last year. All right, thank you very much, Andrean. Um, I am sharing my screen. I hope this works, you see my presentation. Brilliant. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today uh, to the, together with Andrean and Tom to talk about the results of our uh, research that we've conducted uh, specifically in Quebec last uh, summer and fall. Um, as Andrean has mentioned, it's part of a larger project that has been going on for the last two years. Um, there have already been uh, two Cyrano reports, uh, Equiterre report that has been uh, looking into the results of these like previous studies where we focused on Canada in general, and then also in um, experimental designs tested some interventions in order to uh, counteract this um, uh, this like uh, interest in um, SUVs and, and light duty trucks. So what we're going to focus on in this presentation is now uh, the results of the study where we have zoomed in to Quebec and have tried to see what are the factors uh, that are influencing Quebecers specifically um, in their you know, intention to uh, purchase an SUV. And then we've also, um, with this survey, looked more specifically into how are people using their vehicles. Um, the data collection was uh, done in June, so about a month in the field, uh, and we have um, a bit more than a thousand respondents that are representative uh, of the Quebec population. So just like um, with the equivalent for Canada, in this study, we have also been uh, informed by our theory and by uh, prior research in this area that has been looking into what are the key conceptual and theoretical notions that are influencing purchasing uh, intention of a certain vehicle. Uh, and um, we rec replicated most of the uh, theoretical relations that we've already found in the um, survey of Canada. And I'm going to focus more specifically on the aspects um, on the most interesting parts of with regards to the findings of Quebec. So uh, Andrian has already mentioned it, we've seen it in the numbers, uh, the, the sales. Um, SUVs remain um, the most commonly found vehicle in our sample. Overall, if we summarize pickup trucks, uh, minivans and SUVs, light duty trucks account for 57% of the uh, overall sample. Not only are SUVs uh, do they represent the vehicle that's most often owned um, by households in Quebec, but it's also the most popular vehicle. Um, so here on a, on, a, uh, one, on a 100 rating scale, we've asked uh, our respondents to indicate their liking of different types of vehicles uh, and SUVs are by far the most um, popular vehicles. Um, in particular, um, so the rating is in particular high for those that already have an uh, SUV. Now, uh, one aspect was looking into what are the types of characteristics that people look forward when they're buying um, a vehicle. Uh, and here we find that the top five uh, criterion are the same, irrespective of whether the respondents own an SUV or a sedan. And so you see these five aspects here. Uh, there are two items that re re respond to uh, safety. So safety in case of bad weather and winter conditions and safety in case of impact. Um, the vehicle price, as you see, is the most important criteria for sedan owners. Um, and then we also have road holding and uh, fuel consumption. Um, now, as I've mentioned, we've been looking more specifically into how are people actually using um, their vehicles. Oh, sorry, <laughs> financing first. 
Um, so in terms of the, we've seen here that the price is very important, vehicle price, but in terms of the financing, there are differences between those respondents who own an SUV and those respondents who own a sedan. So we see that SUV owners are much more likely to use dealer financing, um, whereas sedan owners uh, tend to be more likely to use their personal savings. Um, so this is an important aspect to understand also um, this, I want to say a bit slippery slope in terms of having increasing costs over a longer time, uh, because the dealer financing um, is particularly attractive for uh, SUVs. Now, in terms of the, the aspects that uh, we've also in previous um, research seen has is most often put forward in terms of the reason for um, buying a vehicle is carrying capacity and um, passenger space and the number of seats. So as you see in these three um, items, it's always SUV owners who um, will allocate more importance to these items. And this is why we decided, OK, we're going to look more specifically into how they're actually using their vehicles with regards to these um, items. I'm not even going to focus in too much detail on the on the rear load and the hitching part because um, there are more than 80% who've never used this uh, um, aspect at all, and more than 90% only use it a few times a year. But what is more interesting is how um, the different vehicle owners are using the seats and the storage space, so the trunk. With regards to the um, to the seats, um, and let me like briefly explain to you what you see on the slide. Uh, the, 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 the darker colors on the left side that represent a higher occurrence. So uh, many times a week, I will use the full capacity or the full the majority of my seats. Um, whereas the lighter colors towards the right means that I'm not using it very often. The, on the very right side, you see never before you see a few times a year. So what is interesting here is that uh, generally, irrespective of the kind of vehicle that um, our respondents own, um, they're not using their the majority of their seats uh, very often. So it's not something that is a necessity every for like their everyday lives. Um, and we see that for SUV uh, owners, about fifty percent. Even though again, seats is something that is you know, uh, an item that is mentioned, um, are using it uh, only um, a few times uh, a year. Uh, the same is true when we look at the aspects on, on storage space. So here we ask, uh, you know, how often do you use the, the full trunk capacity? Uh, and here we look again, we see that an, an overall, once again, um, it's majority is using it only a few times a year or about once a month when we look more at more regularly regular usage in terms of every week or uh, several times a week this proportion is, is smaller and this is again the same kind of um uh pattern that we see also with the with other vehicles with the exceptions of pickup trucks so pickup trucks trucks are really this kind of vehicle where owners report using it much more often with the cargo area than with any kind of um, other vehicle type which points a little bit to this idea that uh, pickup trucks are really used uh, in line with a particular need which is often to transport uh, things now, when we look at the determinants that are influencing the uh, frequency of, of using this vehicle seat, um, it's quite interesting that here what we see has a, a, a quite a large influence in terms of um, uh, adding to the likelihood of having uh, of using the vehicle seats is having one child or two or more children, uh, having an income of a hundred thousand dollars or more, um, and then again the point that I've just mentioned about the need to transport materials uh, or equipment as part of their job. Now, in terms of the determinants for using the full capacity of the cargo space, uh, here we find um, that uh, some demographic aspects that influence this, um, the likelihood to use the full capacity, this is being uh, between 18 and 34 years old and uh, between 55 and 74. Again, children play a role, so having two or more children does influence this as well, and then owning a cottage. Um, when we look more specifically in terms of how do people travel, uh, and this is a bit related to also the, the point that Andrean mentioned before, uh, advertisement uh, suggests that SUVs are being used for uh, the great outdoors. Um, but what we what we see in our survey is that the two the two predominant uses is really to going to school or work and shopping. Um, so these clearly are. Um, usages where there would be in most cases alternatives available um so again most trips are 
in, in for dropping off, picking up children, um, outings, trips, and vacations. So again, I just want to stress this point is that there is an image that is being created by advertising that suggests that uh, SUVs are being, uh, being used for a particular kind of purpose, uh, such as uh, outdoors and so on. Um, and uh, here we see that um, uh, the actual usage looks a little different. Um, now, in terms of the purchasing intention, so here we've looked into what is the likelihood that they're using certain aspects of their vehicles. Uh, we've looked a little bit into how is this influenced by the type of um, vehicle that uh, our respondents own. Now, here we look specifically into the purchase intention. So we've asked this question uh, about what is the, the likelihood of buying um, a particular type of vehicle for the next purchase. And here again, we see that uh, with regards to the likelihood um, there is uh, a greater likelihood that the next uh, vehicle purchase is going to be uh, an SUV. Um, and this is particularly true. And again, a point that Andran has already mentioned is that uh, once you already have an SUV. So um, this is really, again, an important point. Um, not only in terms of once you buy an SUV, uh, you're, you're kind of stuck into the system. That means you're, you continue buying SUVs, but you also make SUVs more normal in the sense of adding to the social norm that as having an SUV and, and, and using it for, uh, you know, grocery shopping is a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, so in terms of the uh, influence of social demographic variables on the purchase intention, um, we see that the purchasing intention is um, particularly high among those that are, again, younger, 25 to 44, live in rural or suburban areas, have a very um, high income. So we talk about an annual household income of more than 125,000, uh, typically own a second home and have two children. So interestingly, um, we see that there is actually a decrease in, in interest once there are more children. Um, in so <laughs> the point that I was just going to, to say is that uh, when we look at the influence of the number of children on purchasing attention, uh, we see that um, with, with three children, uh, the minivan is actually becomes more interesting. So it's that uh, third uh, chart that you see and uh, the blue line. So um, which suggests that those people that really need it, um, they will resort to um, a, a minivan in this case, whereas the um, the inf like having one child, having no child or one child and having two children uh, has a very strong influence on the purchasing intention of um, SUVs. Uh, in order to uh, statistically assess this, we run a couple of regressions in order to look into um, the influence of the theoretical constructs that I've mentioned in the beginning, as well as these contextual variables, so everything that is related to uh, characteristics of the vehicle and then also personal variables. Um, and here we find that, um, again, in line with what prior research has found, that uh, values such as um, uh, being high on materialism uh, or being high on terms of um, the, the non-instrumental motives, such as the emotional motives that I'm associating with driving are going to increase the likelihood that I'm going to purchase an SUV. And um, there is also the social norms, which uh, I find personally is a very important point, again, with this idea that once we buy them, we make them uh, more normal, we see them everywhere, and this just creates a norm of this being, you know, the normal kind of vehicle to own. Once again, this, the strongest influence here comes from the nature of the primary primary vehicle owned. So once we have it, um, we're unlikely to um, to downsize. Um, again, in 2022 in Quebec, SUVs are uh, the most common vehicles owned by 47% of our respondents. So the most uh, commonly owned uh, vehicle. It has the highest level of approval and liking, and it is also the one that is most likely uh, purchased as a next vehicle. Um, in terms of, and this is also important, uh, especially when we compare a little bit what is the, the narrative around SUVs uh, and what is perpetuated by uh, advertisements and by also popular media, we see that uh, the SUV is presented in a way uh, that is, it is not actually used. Um, so only a few times uh, a year or never do people use the full capacity in terms of the trunk space, the, uh, the seats that are available or the possibility to, um, um, to hitch something. Um, so these are all aspects um, that are important to put forward in any kind of communication to show that 
there are alternatives for uh, the majority of time that I'm actually using a vehicle because I'm not using it for these particular purposes that I am I'm being thought to or told to, to um, think of. So this is it, uh, very briefly. Uh, we'll have some time, I see there's already a question, but I know that we'll have some time at the end for the question. So I will just uh, hand over to Tom. Yeah, thank you, Verena. <clears throat> and uh, just want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Vancouver on the unceded traditional territories, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slay the Two Peoples. And uh, I'm presenting the re research that was undertaken by John Axon and his research team at the Simon Fraser University, at the Sustainable uh, Transportation Action Research Team. And we've worked with John on a number of projects and, and really appreciate his research. Uh, and I'm gonna keep it at a fairly high level so that we have time for questions. And just one sec. Uh, everyone seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, like Ekitel, DSF is uh, the foundation is very interested in understanding why are Canadians uh, buying and driving such massive vehicles, which have outsized climate impacts but are also very unfriendly to our communities in terms of uh, safety impacts to other users and they're heavy and hard on our roads and, and just a very poor choice from a, a social and environmental perspective. So we retained um, John's team to look at these research questions, which is basically uh, why do people buy these vehicles? What are the perceived strengths and weaknesses of these vehicles? And what are the images that are driving these purchases? Because we know that a lot of a vehicle purchase is, is very emotional. So that gets into Im images, identities, and then do they understand the societal impacts related to their purchase? And finally, since we want to get into possible, possible policy tools, we want to understand what their willingness to downsize was what kind of policies could we use? So this used a mixed uh, methods approach. Um, we had uh, 986 participants uh, in a 10 minute survey, and that was done in August, 2021. And it compared SUV drivers versus car drivers versus non-drivers. And the focus group method, uh, so we had a second stream of research, which was one hour focus groups of five to 10 participants done over Zoom, four groups of SUV drivers and one each for car drivers and non-drivers to get those perspectives too. So just to summarize the some of the key findings here, SUV drivers think their vehicles are more functional than cars, they're safer. And one thing that's often mentioned is you sit higher in traffic, so you have a better view of what's happening and you can react. They're fun to drive, they carry more, and they're seen as handling better. So they're better over all than a car. So these perceptions don't necessarily map to reality because one thing we know is that a lot of SUVs actually don't handle better in that uh, your, your ability to react in traffic um, in an emergency situation because of the weight can actually be quite reduced. They also um, choose these SUVs for symbolic reasons. They're seen as reliable. You convey success to your neighbors. And of course, they're seen as outdoorsy. That's not surprising given all the advertising around how SUVs fit out in nature and take you to beautiful places in nature and bring you, bring you back closer to your natural roots, I guess. And so overall, they're a sensible choice. And if you buy an SUV, your, your neighbors are gonna, gonna basically approve and your family members as well. In terms of their understanding of societal and environmental impacts, what we see is that um, these impacts are poorly understood or they're downplayed. So uh, safety for other users is downplayed. 
I don't know if many of you have seen a, a video or a demonstration of how you can invite someone to sit in the front of a pickup truck or an SUV and ask them if they're ready to drive, if the road looks good, and then uh, invite them out of the car to see the like 12 kids that are doing chalk drawings on the pavement in front of the car. Um, we also see that because SUVs are advertised in nature, they're seen as best for nature lovers. And I, th I think this, um, this uh, URL here for a website from Car Digest, the best SUVs for nature lovers as an actual name of the blog article is, is telling. And, and there's also low consideration of GHD impacts or a feeling that the GHD impacts are not any different from a car. So one of the, the things that emerges from this research is it seems that SUV drivers are possibly displaying cognitive dissonance when it comes to the climate impacts of SUVs. So this research was done shortly after the very deadly heat wave that hit um, Vancouver and uh, other parts of the lower mainland in which over 500 people were killed. And about 70% of the participants in the survey agree that the 2021 deadly heat wave was caused by climate change. But less than 40% agreed that driving an SUV or pickup contributes more to heat waves than driving a sedan. So a few example quotes from the, the focus groups show the kind of societal impacts and rationalization we're talking about. You know, cars do create a lot of pollution, but when you talk about pollution, big industries, they're the worst polluters. So there's worse than us, so we don't have to worry about our emissions. Um, or a small car emits less pollution, acknowledging that, but a big car is safer. So I'm gonna go with the safer car. So we looked at, uh, we had John look at what kind of financial levers could be used to get drivers to choose smaller cars. Uh, and the findings suggest about 36% of people would be responsive to price signals, but it'd be really, really hard getting those price signals implemented into policy. So here's a positive price signal would be you get a discount on your insurance rates and that um, has a good response in terms of uh, people who say they might downsize and a bit less of a positive response, but quite similar if you add a 10% tax to the to large vehicles. Um, there's not much effect of the rate of vehicle accidents is reduced by 80%. And that one's quite interesting. You know, if you tell people that if you downsize to an SUV and your neighbors did as well, we'd reduce vehicle accidents by 80%, only 10% would choose a smaller vehicle. So here's some examples of um, respondents showing that resistance to policies that incentivize downsizing. Um, in my opinion, you can get SUVs that are more environmentally friendly than smaller cars. So that's a theme that, that emerged a number of times. Um, you need your car for your job or your family, it's your livelihood. So why should you have to pay more taxes or fees for something that is part of your life? or it's seen as a cash grab. And also if it's about fuel consumption, then focus on fuel consumption, not, um, not vehicle size. So just thanks to our, our research team and our funders, the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia, the Bullet Foundation and the um, Godin and Stefan Bronfman Family Foundation. Well, thanks, Tom, for the results, and thanks, Verena, as well. Um, I think it's quite obvious that there are many uh, conclusions that are similar, uh, whether it's in the survey that uh, Verena conducted last year or the other previous results that we have. Um, so it's well, it's quite fascinating to see um, the the to see that we we have the same issues all across the country basically and the same um, same preference for larger vehicles um i'm just gonna wait for my uh, colleague to set up the slide deck thank you very much um i'm just gonna go through a very quick overview of some of the solutions that ikita brings forward um 
We really do believe that, uh, well, regulation has a strong uh, potential to, to bring change. For example, right now, the vehicle emission standards that we have in Canada um, favor the larger models uh, of vehicles uh, because it's easier to reach the standards when the vehicles that you that you make are uh, are larger and heavier uh, and we also think that we should regulate uh, the advertising standards uh, because right now we can see that uh, uh, we mostly see SUV ads which show them in nature a lot uh, of those times rolling on it basically um, over it and um, then we also think that a fee on the most polluting vehicles, a progressive fee based on the weight or the fuel efficiency or fuel inefficiency of the vehicles uh, should be uh, implemented to better reflect the impacts that those vehicles have on society and on the environment. Uh, education and information efforts are obviously key, uh, which is why Equitaire is leading the uh, human scale transportation campaign. Um, we also think that, well, uh, in addition to all of this, we also need to, to offer uh, real, accessible, good uh, alternatives to owning a car, uh, which is through uh, public transit, uh, active transportation, infrastructure, uh, shared mobility options as well. Uh, and lastly, well, that goes hand in hand with stopping uh, the infinite development of our road network. Uh, across the country, but mostly uh, we can see that uh, the impacts are seen in the south of Canada. Um, so uh, there is a lot to do on that front as well. Um, before we go in the Q&A section, I will invite you to sign uh, our petition to, to regulate car advertising uh, and uh, to go on the website of our campaign to uh, use the, our vehicle comp comparator to, uh, well, to compare vehicles uh, between vehicles that are currently on the market to see uh, the impacts that they have uh, on different aspects, whether it's safety or finance or the environment. So um, we can start the Q&A uh, session with the first uh, question, which is aimed at Verena. So SUV owners are clearly purchasing their vehicles for extra seating, but family sizes have been shrinking drastically over the past 30 years, especially for wealthy households. How do we explain this trend? Fewer kids, but need for more space. And Tom, if you want to reply afterwards, uh, feel free to do that as well. Um, I think it's hard to say it uh, only from the results of that survey, but uh, again, this is part of a larger project, but we've also done some interviews, uh, and I think what we find is that um, the idea, and it's a little bit related to this point about when I, you may have one child, or when you have two children, then you're more likely uh, to purchase an SUV, um, because this is the new normal, is as soon as you have a child, and uh, you know, you'll you go to an SUV. So it's not, and, and I think this is the important point, it's not actually related to a real need, but it is a need that has been um, co-constructed by uh, not only advertising, but also every single person that follows this kind of uh, thought process and, and of behavior in terms of, I buy it. So we have, we're, and I have plenty of anecdotes of people that are saying, you know, as soon as we we knew that we were pregnant, we need, we had to have a larger uh, vehicle, we got a, an SUV. So it's really, um, somehow this has been implanted that, you know, once you have the child then the next next logical step basically is that you're gonna get that SUV. Um, so it's not really about, um, again, yeah, I see the trend is going down in terms of children, but uh, they're not actually using it. Those that actually have the, the, the large families with the three children are more likely to go to a minivan. I hope this uh, does respond to um, this point. Tom, I'm not sure if you want to add something. Sure. I mean, I, I think there's also a larger trend societally about materialism and how much stuff we have in our lives. And I noticed I remember as a kid, we'd go for a picnic and there was a kick picnic bas a basket and a blanket. And now people bring, um, they bring a fire ring and then you need the propane tank and we just bring more stuff to things. <laughs> um, but, I but I would say that's maybe a small part of it. And most of it is that advertisers have been very good at showing that, oh, you could have this and you might need this and you probably want to buy big because it's 
it's inconvenient to be squeezed that one time a year where you actually use the full capacity. I would also tend to agree. Um, advertising does create an ideal to achieve. And um, we we really see, we saw it with other products in the past, such as uh, cigarettes, for example. And we now see it with uh, large vehicles. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question uh, about, well, a very interesting question on an, on vehicle kilom kilometers traveled. So. How do you all feel that this research can best be used by groups also working to oppose highway expansion and reduce vehicle kilometers traveled? I feel like this should be something more for like the uh, equitaire than we're, I feel like I'm mostly providing the research. I do have some, you know, personal opinion more or less, I think, uh, and this is related again to this idea that the more uh, SUVs we see, the more this influences the social norm of SUVs being, um, talk about, uh, you know, um, descriptive norms. So what is happening really, not injunctive in terms of what should we be doing, but descriptive norms, what are we seeing? And this is more and more SUVs. The problem is that uh, the idea of like highway expansion is going down that same like path, like vicious cycle of just adding streets so that everybody believes that, you know, it's normal that we go everywhere with a car. Um, so uh, that is my <laughs> two cents on this, but I'm not sure how to best uh, oppose to this. Um, what kind of mechanism would make most sense? Well, I would add that in Quebec, what is causing the increase in greenhouse gas emissions uh, is well, uh, the fact that there are more vehicles, there are bigger vehicles, and they travel more, uh, they do more kilometers. So um, I think that the, the trend towards vehicles like SUVs also brings us to uh, the fact that people do more and like do bigger, travel bigger distances. And that's also one of the reasons that we'll explain, uh, I need a bigger car because I, I travel a lot on the roads. And so it's... We really need to see it from a high level perspective. And, and um, that's why we also tackle every, that, that's why we also advocate for, for better transit and for better urban planning and land use. Uh, so that, because all of these issues are interconnected uh, in my opinion. I, I think Eric Doherty asks a great question here. And I, I think what we're seeing is that if we leave car companies to their own devices, and just let them advertise and sell and and we don't have various regulations such as a zero emission vehicle standard which uh Ekita and david suzuki foundation are, are are advocating for and uh other policies to reduce vkt traveled and and to provide um uh that's distance traveled and to provide more options better public transit other and to reclaim our 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 streets for human use rather than vehicle use, um, then we're we're going to get outcomes that we don't like, which is more large vehicles on roads and um, more pedestrian and 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 cyclist accidents and less willingness to take um, active transportation because the roads feel dangerous. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Lindsay Francis's question. So uh, do you feel that there is a role for auto manufacturers to improve design? I'm not sure. I'm a bad, I'm hardly using vehicles myself. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, in terms of improvement, what I think would should be regulated is the fact that uh, without any clear motivations, vehicles are getting larger and larger every year. So as part of another uh, project, we have done uh, mystery shopping uh, visits in, in, in car dealers. Uh, and whenever they were, the, there was also happening at the end of last year, and whenever we were talking to the car dealers in terms of uh, the new model, they said, we cannot give you a lot of details, but we know that it's going to be eight centimeters larger. And then we asked the question about do these eight centimeters are they additional trunk space or is this passenger space? And it's and they just responded with a li it's a little bit you know overall like everywhere so you're not going to notice it. But then why adding eight centimeters? So I think this is more problematic. Um, is before even going as far as saying improving the design is like making a stop to just increases in in sizes that have no clear advantage. 
And I would add to that that, well, uh, the safest uh, vehicle is the one, well, the safest car is the one that doesn't exist, uh, So, which, is all, which also relates to everything that I was saying earlier. And the vehicle emission standard that I suggest that we um, that we tighten, well, this is kind of, this is a vehicle by which manufacturers do tend to favor uh, larger vehicles. And that's why we need to strengthen them um, because, well, that causes the, the disappearance of the smaller vehicles. Even the, the uh, Honda Civic, for example, is uh, larger, higher, heavier than the same car that it was than, than, than the Honda Civic from 20 years ago. So that's really something that we need to, to be aware of and that we need to, to tackle through regulation in my mind, um, for sure. Because other than that, the safe features I think are for people inside the vehicles at least are always getting better from what yeah. we see. I, th I think a key answer to this question is that auto manufacturers are not going to do things for the public good unless they are required to. They're in the business of making money and if selling bigger, deadlier cars makes more money, that's what they'll do. Um, so we need regulations that improve fuel efficiency, but also improve the the safety of other road users and the fact that there's I often look at the Globe Mail um, vehicle review and they never mention how safe it is for other users of the road or how how many feet or meters in front of the car is it before you can actually see what's on the road so these kind of things that um, we should be regulating and and a big concern I'm having now is the the arrival of electric vehicles that have tremendous acceleration rates and you have very, very heavy vehicles that can accelerate at great speed, but they also don't tend to report how many seconds does it take to go from 100 kilometers an hour to zero. It's always from zero to 100, not the opposite. Maybe if I can add something, and this is related to Aaron's question as well uh, about the safety st statistics comparing SUVs to sedans. And what Tom mentioned, I think the point is also to to look into when there is safety reported. It's always the um, the safety of the of the the person inside, and we never think of safety uh, more globally in terms of how safe is it for all of us. Um, and here, I think this is very important to to consider. And I would add also that, well, uh, as part of the uh, study that we did, we we assessed the the, uh, the level of of uh, the severeness of the of the um, consequences of a collision with SUVs and with cars, and we do see that they that the they are hurt more badly when it's a collision with a bigger car. So that also brings a case for for smaller vehicles. Uh, and not just on the uh, environmentalist uh, impact. And I will put some links uh, in the chat for, for that uh, question. Uh, next question would be in uh, another question from Keen Grunding. In terms of SUVs, what is the framing that works in terms of dissuading people from buying them? It seems like it may not be pro-social or pro-environmental messaging. Is there anything else that work? Um, so in this second report that I've mentioned, we've we tried a couple of framings in experiments to see what would reduce uh, the interest in an SUV. Um, and as you say, this it doesn't work by making people aware of this um, of the, the the environmental impact. And it is a little bit related to the same idea that you know worked with the truth campaign in terms of smoking is how can we change the narrative around the back then smoking from something that is an act of rebellion towards something that is a very like conform conformist kind of behavior. Um, so in terms of the, the, the messages and the framings that worked as an intervention was something like, so I'm just giving you an example of one of the messages that we, we used in one experiment was like, do you, do you still uh, know how to drive or do you already have an SUV in a sense of like people that uh, have no feeling and this is something that emerged from the qualitative uh, research that we've done before is um, this idea of uh, sedan owners that SUV drivers are bad drivers uh, they rely too much on um, the technical aspects the four-wheel driving and they have no feeling for the road itself um, so trying to uh, associate this image of, you know, being a bad driver with uh, SUVs 
did at least hurt the egos of the respondents that we had. And uh, it did show that there was a, a decrease in interest, um, which is encouraging in, a, in that experiment. I'm not sure to what extent this is uh, possible to roll out uh, on uh, in a campaign. Yeah, uh, we were a bit discouraged from this research in terms of what framing might be used. I do wonder if there's uh, a vein that, can, you know, when you want to get people to be more energy efficient in their homes, you tell them what their neighbors are doing and that neighbors on your street have managed to save 30% of energy and you're above that and you could do better. That kind of framing seems to have been useful in the energy conservation field. Now with SUVs, it's a bit of a challenge because um, there are so many SUV owners and people are buying more higher percentages of them. But I think we need to start uh, sharing that some of the, the negative perceptions of SUVs, the safety concerns of SUVs that, you know, people in your neighborhood are worried about the increasing size of cars on the road and what this does to child safety in their streets, something like that kind of framing. But I think this is an area where we need to do more research and experimentation. And another challenge, of course, is that the advertising budgets of the auto companies is staggeringly large compared to anything uh, what we can muster to reach out through social media. Yeah, so we had a social norm message framing as well. And as Tom said, it did work. But the problem is just that it's not the reality. So even though, uh, like the theory suggests by, uh, you know, changing the descriptive norm to being something else than SUVs, it also decreases the interest. Unfortunately, the problem is that, as Tom mentioned, it is, you know, there, there are more and more SUVs. And this is why it's also so important to focus on these first time buyers and make sure that they are not even that they're not only become it, that they enter in this like SUV tunnel themselves, but that they also perpetuate this idea that this is the new norm. Sorry, Andrea. No worries, no worries. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Jun Nubiami's question. So what about uh, regulating uh, regulation in terms of vehicle width? As vehicles get larger, it is the width that creates crowding, making it difficult to claim space for cyclists and pedestrians. I mean, I totally agree. That'd be a great thing to to focus in on is the size of vehicle, including the width, and um, vehicle width, including sometimes the mirrors that are out large, and um, or people who put out size tires that protrude from their from their truck. Like, there's so many things. I even saw a truck that had uh, three inch long metal spikes, uh, pointy metal spikes. They'd added where the bolts were. Uh, which looked rather unfriendly to cyclists and pedestrians. Um, I think in terms of, if I may add something, because uh, so I'm from Austria and in Austria, they have established a rule that if you take over a cyclist, you have to be at least a, a meter and a half away. Uh, which means that de facto in most of the streets, you can no longer overtake a cyclist. And they are really adamant about it and would knock on your window and say that was not a meter and a half. Uh, and, you know, so it's not only, I think, regulation in terms of the vehicle as such, but also how do uh, the vehicles use the, 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 the public space and the space that they're supposed to share with other uh, road participants um, and, and and here to, to, to you know, push in favor of those that are more vulnerable and give them more space, which automatically means that the larger your car is, the more likely you are to ever being able to take over. So, Thank you. Um, one last question, but uh, if you want to stay after and ask uh, questions and chat with us, uh, it will be our pleasure. Um, is there an opportunity for organizations like yours to coordinate with Vision Zero strategies being Im implemented at the sub-regional or municipal level, light truck use and pedestrian cyclists that rates are connected? Tom, do you want to start? I mean, I, I think we're very happy to collaborate with, you know, whoever wants to improve transportation in cities, um, address safety address community well-being and also making economies or local communities more economically um, more vital because you have more people using the street by walking cycling uh, sidewalk cafes all these kind of things that uh, are increasingly dominate car dominant culture is uh, 
makes difficult. And I'm going to add that that's also uh, that what we are doing with our campaign at the moment. That's why we have partners from uh, different uh, sectors, including Piéton Québec, uh, Pedestrians Québec in English, uh, and also Accès Transport Viable, which are organizations that work at local levels to really make neighborhoods safer. Uh, so that's really part of our vision and also why we work with the the, the, the public safety organization of uh, the Montreal region. Um, but it's a really good angle that we need to focus on more. And that also relates to uh, Aaron O'Mellon's question on uh, the safety, um, on, on, the, on how we should also collaborate with schools and with parents association and groups like that uh, to, to bring our message forward. Um, so thank you everyone for your participation. I see that there are a lot of questions uh, remaining. Uh, so feel free to stay, as I mentioned. Uh, thanks Tom Green from the David Suzuki Foundation and Verena Gruber from uh, Emily on Business School and uh, partner at Cyrano. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.